you're just trying to maximise your, your big guns, if you like. <laughs> you're trying to put all your eggs, all your eggs in a basket. Whereas, you know, another year, if there's two people who are much better than everyone else, you might say, right, you're the you're in a two person boat, you're the priority. So yeah, in my year, they selected a four and a pair, but we're you know, we're all university students, so we're all dotted around the country, all having different levels of academic workload. So it's it's quite a juggle. Um, yeah, that was my question in terms of how obviously how do you train together then if you is it just kind of getting together on squad weekends and things and just yeah. doing your training? Is that with, training? with difficulty. You're driving you're driving to Dorney Lake, which is where the squad was based at that point, which is near Windsor. You're driving to Dorney Lake at four AM to get there at half six or whatever mm-hmm. to do a weekend's training and then driving back again and doing some academic work in the afternoon. Yeah, it, it's a juggle, but if you want to be your best, as you will know, if you if you want to be as good as you can be, you've got to commit to it. From Coordinate Sports, it's The Drive Phase, a show about sports founders, leaders and experts and the stories behind their business journeys. Our guest this episode is Annie Vernon. Annie is an Olympic silver medalist and a two-time world champion rower. Her book, Analyzing the Psychology of Professional Sport, won the British Sports Book Awards in 2020. Now retired from rowing, the Cambridge alumni juggles the responsibilities of working in marketing and communications for LAPS, an organisation that connects ex-athletes with support and employers whilst being an accomplished corporate speaker, journalist and writer. During the show, Annie discusses her journey in elite sports, winning Olympic medal and competing at home games as well as the process behind researching and writing her award-winning book, Mind Games. Enjoy the show. So I'm delighted to welcome Annie Vernon to the show today. Annie is an Olympic silver medalist and world champion rower, award-winning author, corporate speaker, freelance journalist, and communications and marketing manager at uh, Life After Professional Sport, or LAPS. Um, welcome to the show, Annie. Hi, James. Hi. Yeah, loads to get through, you see on the intro, so hopefully we'll, we'll do it justice and squeeze as much as we can into the into the time we have today. What we normally do is, for our listeners, just to give them a bit of background on you, get to know you a little bit better, normally take it back to childhood and, and ask you to reflect back a little bit and, and tell us how you describe your childhood growing up. Yeah, I suppose in terms of people who go on to a career in sport, my childhood was probably quite unique in that a lot of people seem to say, oh, you know, my, my parents ran the local rugby club or my siblings were into cricket or, you know, I was being dragged along to the swimming pool from when I was 10 or, you know, I grew up next to the local football club, whatever it is. But for me, it that was, was going to be that. my question. I was going to ask you if you come from a rowing family. No, not at all. Not at all. Not even a particularly sporty family at all. So I grew up on a farm, which so it, it was an extremely active childhood. You know, we were outside pretending to work on the farm, probably getting in the way of my parents most of the time. But, you know, it's just very outside, you know, proper traditional stuff, climbing trees, making dens, falling in the mud. So it was a very active childhood, but in terms of structured, proper sport, you know, with all the kind of academy pathways that exist now, none of that at all. I was outside getting fit, but not in any kind of structured way at all. Oh, right. So how about school then? So when you've gone to school and, and, and gone to school, were you one of the sporty kids? Obviously you're active, but was it, did you take to sport then? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second I got into school and started going to school and, you know, the, in the 90s, it was all netball and hockey for girls and football and rugby for boys. There weren't as many options as when I go to schools now. And I see all these you know, amazing facilities that kids are able to access. So it was, it was, quite, a, it was quite a limited number of sports on offer. But no, I, I love sports school. I really loved competitive team sports right from the word go. And obviously, as we know in sport, there's a huge range of motivation, a huge range of why people love this. But for me, the competition was a really big part of it. You know, I liked being tested. I liked being out there trying to play in the big games. I think it helped that one of my best friends as a kid, she was also really sporty. And we were kind of like the two sporty kids in the year. You know, we we're probably the best at sport in our year. And I, I do like but look back now. I think that was one of the things that really pushed me on. You know, there was always this person, you know, who was as good at me or if not better. In fact, when it came to running and swimming, she was definitely better. And you just, you don't want to lose to your mates, do you? It's okay yeah. losing someone else, but if it's your mate, <laughs> it's personal. Definitely. I know you touched on it there in terms of the landscape back then in the 90s uh, for like boys yeah. and girls in school. Did you, lucky that you had that kind of rivalry or whatever with your friends and you both into sports, it was, it was positive. Was yeah. there any other role models at that time? Was it maybe a PE teacher or someone that, that you kind of looked up to? Was it, was it, was it that kind of uh, your peers you were kind of inspired by to keep engaged? Yeah, I mean, I, I had some... Amazing PE teachers. I'm sure everyone looks back and 
pinpoints one or more PE teachers being someone who really almost believed in them and made them think about the next level. But, you know, we're talking about rural Cornwall in the middle of nowhere. The idea that what you were doing there as a kid might one day be connected to competing for the country would have, you know, would have seemed completely ludicrous. There was no, I mean, my, my niece is a really keen rugby player now and she's in touch with the academy of the professional club near us in Devon. You know, and they're in touch with kind of national pathways to the, you know, to the RFU. And I'm not saying she's going to go anywhere with rugby, but that she can see that route. Whereas yeah. for me in the 90s, that route didn't exist. You know, it was, like I said, it, it was laughable. Because even at that point, the British Rome team was, wasn't professional at all. And, and again, didn't have any kind of development structure outside of the immediate senior national team. And, you know, you know the opportunities exist now that they didn't exist then. So for me, it was it was really just luck that I ended up going to university that was really big on rowing. And that's where my rowing really took off. It definitely. I know in terms of you touched on it there, rowing, the, the, cause to set the scene in terms of what rowing looked like. So I know prior to 2012, let's say, Usually, poor. There was this kind of talent ID pack roadshow that was going on, trying to recruit people, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Was that wasn't your way in, though? Was it? Was it more of a local level where you got involved, or was it at university? Well, I started rowing at a club near my house when I turned seventeen. And when I say near my house, it was about forty-five minute drive away. Which, again, in rural Cornwall, is just down the road. <laughs> That's yeah. close. So when I turned seventeen and started driving, I thought I really want to try a new sport, do something new, meet some new people. I mean, it, there was. Basically, my version of Teenage Rebellion. That was the closest yeah, I was going to ask got. you, I know you said around the corner, but in 45 minutes, you've got to get there. So you've got to have some intention to go to yeah. the session. It wasn't like you just stumbled across it, right? Yeah, well, driving from North Cornwall to South Cornwall was about as rebellious as I ever got. But I saw that as, you know, my thing I was going to do. It was different to my friends and different to my brothers. So I, I knew some people down at the club, so I started going down there at weekends and just immediately fell in love with it. And I'm sure, James, it's probably the same with you and your sport and probably everyone listening to this who's who's been into a particular sport is when you find your sport, that's it. You know, it's like love at first sight and you know that it suits you down to the ground. That was definitely what happened for me with rowing. You mentioned university there. So you went to study yeah. at Cambridge. I did. Was that a, assuming it's an academic choice, it wasn't for rowing, but was, that was just a bonus, was it? Or, or is that just where it took off and you got really got involved in in uh, Yeah. The, yeah, it was a total fluke, really. I mean, like I said, I, I wrote a bit, but obviously at that point, you have no idea how good you are. You have no idea. It's not like you ever think this could be a career or this could be something I could do for my country. And it was just fluke. You know, I went to Cambridge for obvious reasons because it's the best university in the world or one of them. You know, absolutely over the moon to get in, as you can imagine. And then when I got there, I, you know, obviously I knew about the boat race, the Oxford Cambridge boat race, but I had no idea just how big a sport it is. You know, it's this huge it's the number one sport at the university by a long way. It's a sport that everyone has a go at, everyone tries. Each college has its own boat club. They have these particular, really strange college races twice a year. It's got this huge social life attached to it. So, like I said, it's it's hard not to row. If you turn up at Oxford or Cambridge and you're tall and sporty, it's hard not to get dragged into it. So I, I you know, didn't even get dragged into it. I threw myself into it head first. And then as I was rowing for university, I got selected for the British Rowing World Class Start Scheme, which was quite a new scheme at that point. It aimed to take physically people with the right physical parameters, so tall, strong people, and then put them into a, a system of coaching and development and support to enable them to compete at British national trials. And for me, I, I'm not sure I would have made it because at that point in Cambridge, there wasn't really any pathway for the women to trial for the national team because you had to trial for the national team in, in single boats, whereas all rowing at Cambridge at that point was in eights. But yeah, I was extremely lucky to have made the, the World Class Start scheme and even luckier through that to have met my coach, Adrian Cassidy. He was the person that enabled me to, to take a huge leap forward and also to start realising this could be something I could do, you know? I just, I'm interested to hear, I know you said you had... Yeah. Because from the outside looking in, I don't think many people would realise how big of a sport it is, like you said, at the university mm -hmm. and the structure. And obviously it's, it's clear that you kind of, like many people do, they go to university, find their tribe in the uni and it's the yeah. for yourself which rowing. What was kind of the, the hierarchy like, if that makes sense? So you're obviously you're selected for GB, but was it you represent your college and then there's a college league? And so how does that, what a setup? I'm just intrigued on that. Yeah, so you're right. You represent your college and there is, they call college bumpy races where you chase boats and try and hit them. So it's, it's quite exciting. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's very unique to Oxford and Cambridge, but it's extremely exciting to do. So you kind of chase a boat down a bendy river and try and hit it before it hits the boat in front or before you get hit. So it's called the bumps. So you, you do that for your college. And if, if you fancy taking the next step up, you attempt to trial for the university to do the boat race, you know, Oxford Cambridge boat race, which has just happened back in a few weeks ago in early April. 
And then if you are lucky enough to try and take the next step, then, yeah, you think about national trials. But there's no kind of real pathway from one to the next. It's really up to you to want to to choose to make the next step. Because obviously the colleges want to keep their best rowers. The university wants to keep its best rowers. And I ended up in my third year not rowing for the college or the university because I was just wanting to focus on preparing myself for GB under 23 trials, which I did and, and made the team. But at the same time, you know, you felt like you were turning your back on, you know, on the clubs that really meant a lot to you. But yeah, definitely. And definitely missing it. out, I guess, on the social side as well. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I made up for it my first two years. <laughs> so when you're going to trials, I'm just intrigued. I know you, you mentioned it there back then for, for women. It wasn't the same, right? So in terms of the got the eights and, and what was the options available for you as a, as a woman then to, to compete in? There weren't that many. I mean, the men have always had the boat race, which is a, you know, a huge deal. There's always had a lot of money behind it. And until 20. 12 the women women had a boat race but there wasn't really any money behind it it didn't necessarily provide a route into the British team in the period I was there I mean the period before I was there it successfully got a lot of people onto the team but the period I was at Cambridge it was a bit of a lull so for me yeah it it was making the world class start scheme and having that ability to learn to throw a single skull you know even down to somebody telling me right this is how to do a a 5k time trial which is what the British trials were at that point this is how you're going to be assessed this is how you need to push yourself right we've got a training weekend coming up in Nottingham you know, I'll drive you there I'll work out accommodation so just all those tiny things which is a you know a 21 year old you don't really know particularly for me I've not come through the junior rowing system you know I really felt like an outsider so just having somebody who'd been through the system a coach just to sort all that stuff out for you and tell you how to do it. You know, this is how to attack seat racing. These are the coaches you need to impress. These are the people you need to phone and, you know, tell them your the scores you're pulling on the ergos or, or whatever it is. You know, you can't do anything on your own in sport or in anything. Yeah. You've just got to have the right people around you. Definitely. And so at that time you you made the GB team, the under twenty threes. Yeah. And how does it work in terms of your selection? So you've you've obviously achieved the, the standard, but are you then, um, so you found your coach as well, are you, are you kind of put into a certain discipline or is it kind of what you'd, what you, what you'd like to do? Oh, I think they every year they, they assess it slightly differently and it's really about the shape of the squad, James. So if you've got right. one person who's head and shoulders above everyone else, you probably put them in a, a single skull, a one-person boat. If you've got a group of, so in my year we had a group of about six of us who were all about the same standard, a bit of a training group. So they, they selected a four and a pair. So you're, you're just trying to maximise your, your big guns, if you like. You're trying to put all your eggs, all your eggs in a basket. Whereas, you know, another year, if there's two people who are much better than everyone else, you might say, right, you're the you're in a two person boat, you're the priority. So, yeah, in my year, they selected a four and a pair. But we're, you know, we're all university students. So we're all dotted around the country, all having different levels of academic workload. So it's it's quite a juggle. Um, yeah, that was my question in terms of how, obviously, how do you train together then? If you Is it just kind of getting together on squad weekends and things and just yeah. doing this? Is that, is with, yeah. with difficulty. You're, dri- you're driving to Dorney Lake, which is where the squad was based at that point which is near Windsor you're driving to Dorney Lake at 4am to get there at half six or whatever to do a weekend's training and then driving back again and doing some academic work in the afternoon yeah it, it's a juggle but if you want to be your best, as you will know if you if you want to be as good as you could be you've got to commit to it and accept if that's going to take number one step in your life priority in your life then other things have got to go I guess if we fast forward a little bit in terms of how you were able to then become a professional so I guess without funding it's must be difficult. I'm intrigued in terms of is there like a, a circuit whereby you might earn prize money, et cetera, et cetera. I know for a lot of Olympic sports, it's the money isn't there, if that makes sense. They, they, it's kind of a, a big sacrifice and, and it's all on all on the athlete. But how was it then? And I guess opposed to now as well, is there any, is, it, is it any different now? No, um, well, it's lottery funding. Mm. That's what funds everything. And, and rowing's quite lucky because we've had so much success that we do, you know, we're kind of first in the queue when the money's given out, which, which helps. And yeah, a lot of that filters down to the development athletes. So I think I think my third year at university, I think I've got two thousand pounds in my third year. Right. I might be making it up. It might be more like one thousand pounds thinking about it. But it's you know, it's still enough to take the edge off all the training costs of driving backwards and forwards. And then once, you know, once you're away as a senior, you get funded enough to live to live and train full time so there's there, there is obviously it's not a professional sport there's no sense of you know spectators buying tickets or shirt sales or whatever but you know, the lottery provides enough money for people who are good enough to be able to commit to it which is I guess 
how it should be. Yeah, and then obviously it's all about those Olympic cycles at that point, right? Trying to get to the obviously you got the world champs as well, which yeah, success for yourself there. But your first was it, was Beijing your first Olympic cycle? Or did you... Yeah, so so I was quite lucky. I, I joined the team. Well, I graduated the same summer as the Athens Olympics in two thousand and four. So it was quite a good time to join the senior team. You know, you've got all the girls came back from Athens with medals. You know, they won three medals across their three boats, which was just the best result that Britain had ever had in women's rowing by a long way. Most of those girls were carrying on. So you had, what was it, I think six or seven Olympic medalists just training next to you, you know, in the changing room, in the gym, which for a 21-year-old was like, you know, eyes out on stalks. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm training next to these people. I've just seen them on TV. And, and it's also just a good time to join the team because it is one of those, you know, the slate is wiped clean. We've got four years before Beijing. Let's, you know, let's shuffle the pack. Let's throw everything in the air and let's see what happens. Mm. Whereas if you try to break into the senior team a year before the Olympics, chances are that door won't be open. Yeah. Whereas the door's wide open to everyone. So actually there was quite a lot of us who moved up to join the team at the same mm. time, which was great because then there was a big gang of us who were all, you know, kind of young idiots together, not knowing our elbows from our backsides. So we all kind of learned together, which, which was quite refreshing, really. Nice. And you met, we were talking just off um, before we started the recording about, I guess, the volume of training because of the, the nature of the event. A lot of hours need to be put in a lot of yeah. mileage, a lot of endurance training. So obviously that would make it difficult to do anything else, obviously mm. training and recovery, etc. But yeah. And we'll go on to obviously talk about writing. But at that point, you were doing a little bit of writing. Was that prior to the Games or after the Games? So alongside my rowing, I, I was trying to do something. Like we said, it, it is quite hard to fit in just because of the sheer amount of hours you spend training. I mean, you're doing four to six hours a day of training in addition to the traveling between training centers, warming up, stretching, seeing the physio, seeing the massage therapist, having meetings with your coach, you know, loading your boats, unloading your boat. There's a heck of a lot to do to fit into each day. So by the time you have a bit of downtime, generally you just want to fall asleep. Yeah. Um, so it's not conducive necessarily to anything else but I did sign up for a master's degree part-time which I completed over two years following that I did an internship for a few months um, and then I started to try and push a bit more for my writing commitments mainly because I always wanted to have a, a life after rowing you know I never saw it as a, as a career although as it turns out it has enabled me to have an amazing career so I always wanted to have other things going on and not just become quite a one-dimensional rower. But I guess this is the, the problem with sport going from amateur to professional is there's, for some people, it's great. All they want to do is you know, eat, sleep, train. But if you want to work or study, it's virtually impossible because you just don't have time or energy outside of training. I mean, in terms of, we'll go on to speak about laps, et cetera, but yeah. it sounded like obviously you had a plan, almost like a plan to know, right, this is what I a life after mm. uh, rowing. Would you say that was detailed that you wanted to be, I guess, a writer first and foremost, or was there anything else that you're thinking, if, almost hedging your bets, I guess, because until you got into the team, obviously a couple of years in, you might need you to have your options open, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, for me, writing was always probably quite high on the list. You know, I was quite interested in politics as well, so that was, I guess, something else I was thinking about at that point. But I think another thing, and this is true of every sports person, is you're never quite sure when it's all going to end, are you? <laughs> it could end in a week, it could well, end in yeah, five Yeah, I mean, especially years. because of the way you, you, way you described that as well, you kind of got a whole batch of new athletes coming in to yeah. try and take your spot. And I guess, like you said, uh, yeah. the, the girls have come off 2004 games, but all you guys, you were looking to take the take their, spa, their yeah, spot. Yeah, we turned up, you know, move over, girls. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah, and I mean, it's, I guess in rowing to an extent, you can think in four-year cycles, but whether or not you will be involved for that four-year cycle, you just don't know it. As, I mean, rowing's quite lucky. We don't get the kind of injuries that you see in, say, football, rugby. You're not gonna, no one's gonna tackle you and break your leg. So injury, I guess, is less of a is less of a concern. But for sure, you don't quite play your cards right. The coach decides, you know, he's he's not as as keen keen on you. And before you know it, a few things go wrong, and you can be on your way out. So I'm really intrigued about the kind of run up to the games, that four year cycle. So you've got 2007, year before the games, normally when everything happens, everyone gets in position, it's mm. really starting to focus. And that's when you, that, that was your first world championship. Yeah. So the, the Beijing Olympiad, I think, was quite interesting because the aim was to win gold. Okay. British women had never won Olympic gold in rowing. And we wanted to be the first, our group, our, our cohort. So the, the quad, which is four people, two oars each, that was the, the, the priority boat. They won a gold medal in 2005, so you know year one of the Olympic cycle, not with me on board. They won another gold in 2006, 
again, not with me on board, but they only won that gold after the, the winning crew failed the drugs test and they got upgraded. So on the day, they won silver. What, and I what, think country, was the win- what, what country was the winning crew at that point? That got uh, can you guess? I was going to go... China or Russia, maybe? Yeah, it's the Russians. Yeah. The Russians, yeah. 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 Okay. But there was, I mean, I can tell you the story of the drugs test. It's, it's, quite, it's quite a lengthy one. But fundamentally, they didn't find out until January. Right. So the World Championships were in August, and they didn't find out until January. Okay. Yeah, there was a massive screw-up in the drugs testing process. And anyway, so it was a very traumatic event for them. You know, they, they really wanted to back up their gold medal year before by defending mm. that title and, and weren't able to on the day. And obviously, subsequently, you find out, or would say, oh, you're world champions, but it doesn't mean as much then, does it? Because you right. still lost. You still lost on the day. And they felt like that was a race they could have won. So really, after that, you know, it was a sense of the slate has to be wiped clean. We have to be better in everything we do. We have to raise the standards. And, and again, just that sense of shuffling the pack again. And I'd had a really good winter and I'd started to think, you know, could this be my year? You know, I'd really have my eyes on the quad and I thought, you know, I feel like I, I could really challenge for a seat in the quad. And then as it happened, one of the girls needed surgery. So one of the existing four stepped out to have surgery for that year. And I was the best of the rest. So I then stepped in. So then I had my first year in the quad. We won, um, sorry, we won World Championship Gold. That was amazing. But I always knew she was going to come back in again. So then you're in this situation where you're the defending world champion. You've got 12 months before the Olympics. The pressure is immense. Mm. And there's five of you for four seats. So it was stressful. <laughs> it sounds like. <laughs> you And you really felt like you couldn't put a foot wrong. You know, it was it was a tough winter and we were all going for it. Because not only did all five of us, and well, we're actually part of a group of seven. All seven of us were, were trying to get in the quad, but we're all trying to win gold as well. So it wasn't like just getting in the quad was the only thing. You wanted to get in the quad, then you wanted to be part of the crew that could win gold. So it was an extremely tense winter. The selection, you know, there was no kind of clear this person is head and shoulders above everyone else. It's really, really close amongst all of us. And then how does selection some- work on that one? Just, just as a just out of curiosity, in terms of difficulty, is obviously your teammates, yeah. but you're all competitors at the same time. And is it just a purely kind of subjective thing? Or is it like, oh, you're putting the numbers up, so you've got to be in there? Or is it or is it almost like a bit like a relay? You know, mm. they're better on second leg to third, and kind of the mix of the team. Well, it, yeah, that's a really good question, James. And I actually think selection when it comes to rowing is, is really unique because it's both an endurance sport and a team sport. So in team sports, you accept, you know, oh, Gareth Southgate is going to pick these people up front, these people in defence, because he thinks that's who's going to win. And everyone's like, cool, he can make that subjective decision. But in endurance sports, you have this huge bank of data and numbers that says, you know, this person is moving the boat better than this person. This person is stronger than this person. This person Mm -hmm. has a better result than this person. So you can really rank all your athletes. But the coaches should still have some subjectivity to say, I don't know, look, at the moment we've got four extroverts. We really need a bit more personality in this crew. I'm going to put this person in, even though they might be a bit slower on paper, because I think they're going to get the most out of everyone else. It's just the, like the chemi- mix of the chemistry between it, the two. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. And that's actually where rowing is unique, because generally you have team sports, hockey, netball, football, rugby, or you have endurance sports where you can you can measure on data, you know, triathlon, swimming, cycling, running. But rowing's both. And that's where I think the coaches actually have a really tough job because the athletes say, we want you to select on the numbers, you know, judge me on my results, judge me on my numbers. But I personally think that the coaches should have some subjectivity and they should be able to say, look, this boat needs a leader. This person, you know, she's a real leader. She needs to go in because I think she'll drive everyone else on. That, but that's got to be so they, difficult they for the athletes. Yeah, I was going to say it's got to be so difficult for the athletes that miss out yeah. right at that point. It's kind yeah. of like, especially yeah. if their numbers maybe are slightly better or whatever. Is it? How does that work? It, obviously, you got selected that time. So yeah. I, I, know, I guess you must have been on the other end of it as well at some points in your career. Yeah, um, it, it, exactly. And the guys it, who do Obviously, was, it's painful. How, yeah, how did it? Yeah, the guys who, I mean, luckily, I think I generally was on the right side of it. I was, I mean, I was had a really good relationship with my coach. But for people who miss out, yeah, you feel really cheated and really hard done by. And also, you, it might be that the coach actually has made the wrong decision. And you know, you only know that with hindsight. You know, you can only look back and say, oh, do you know what, that, that crew just didn't really fire. Perhaps had they put an X rather than Y, it might have fired. Because, you know, the whole point of teamwork is sometimes it is just that tiny little, almost intangible element that just makes it all spark, doesn't it? And you, you see that in rowing. You do see sometimes, you know, a really small, on paper, quite a small, weak person in the crew. And you think, well, why is that person in? But then 
within the crew they'll be like look when that person's in the boat the whole thing just flows and they can just be that that link man to just bring the whole rhythm of the crew together but you can't num- you know you can't put a number on it you can't put it on paper it's just yeah. it just happens yeah it's that energy right you can find that in any team yeah. especially in work we're going to talk about moving into into kind of um professional exactly. careers elsewhere it's like you bring and that energy and you pull people along with you exactly and you can say that in the workplace you can say that in most team sports but in rowing it's so hard to, to do that with your selection because the athletes want to be judged on their numbers and their performances, rightly so. Yeah. So, so it's it's kind I, of somewhere in the middle. Definitely. So running up to the games then, what, what is the, just to give us a bit of an insight into that selection. So how does it, mm. I guess, how is it announced? And then if also someone misses out, are they on the team as like reserves, backups, etc.? Do they get a medal as well when when you finish, or how does it? How does it's it kind of like you know the you know the kids game kaplunk where you put a ball in the top and it wobbles its way down. It's a bit like that. So if somebody doesn't make the top boat, they kind of knock into the next crew, and then somebody gets knocked out the bottom of that, and they get knocked into the next crew, and then you know several places down, someone gets knocked out the bottom into the spare, and then the right. spare gets sent home. So I mean, it's right. pretty brutal. And it does mean the bottom of the squad, you just have less consistency because you're so reliant on what's happening above you, which you know must be really demoralizing. But yeah, so I was kind of lucky enough throughout that winter to be told, okay, you know, you've done enough, your place is safe. So there were three of us who were told, you know, you're in the quad, but then it came down to the last two. And then we had just had this extremely stressful, I don't know, month perhaps, where we were just switching between people, mm. the coach trying to make a decision on what was right, what was wrong. In the end, he made a call and you know. I don't know if it was the right call or not. I mean, I you have no idea unless you could turn back time, which you exactly. can't. <laughs> so a bit we've got like so Beijing as, a, as an experience yeah. how was that for you obviously going out there and um, I don't know if it was your first time in China or, or first Olympics obviously it was but how did mm. um, I guess what, what was the experience like but also what did you take away from it I know we're going to talk about transferable experiences etc yeah how was it for you? It was very hot, very humid, mm. which I think I'm quite clocked how hot and humid it was. I mean, you got used to it pretty rapidly, but, you know, those first few days, you're just thinking, I can't breathe. I feel like I'm in a sauna. Yeah, it was great fun. As a first Olympics, you, you can't get more, more of a contrasting culture than Britain and China, can you? You know, it's just, apart from anything, there was the time difference. There was, you couldn't read the newspaper. They did put a BBC, I think it was BBC One feed into our hotel. So technically we had British TV, but it was eight hours difference. So we'd be mid-afternoon and there'd be like the breakfast news on or like homes under the hammer in the evenings, which nobody wants to watch at any time of the day. So yeah, you really felt like you were a foreign planet and it was Planet Olympics and it was just the most special, unique, unbelievable experience of my life and I think um you know it's one of those things if until you've done it it's really hard to explain you know I guess it's a bit like becoming a parent but that moment of walking into the Olympic village and just realizing looking around thinking I'm an Olympian and no one can ever take that away from me and actually it doesn't matter where I finish it doesn't matter where everyone else finishes I'm an Olympian and that is you know one of the most amazing things you can do as a sports person Definitely. And how would you contrast that to the um, to 2012, to London? Well, it's a very different, you know, you go from this totally alien society to London, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is where I lived. And not in, even London, Stratford, which is, you know, so far east. And then we competed in Dorney, which is you know way, way off the west side of London. So it, it was it was it was a very different experience. I mean, I, I was in the bottom ranked boat at that point, having been quite badly injured and ill. So Again, in terms of the performance, it was quite a different experience. You know, we were we were kind of fighting fires a little bit. In a really talented crew, but a talented crew that we weren't able to bring our best rowing to the Olympic Regatta. So it was a very different experience in in lots of lots and lots of different ways. I would say the the biggest thing was you know it never really felt like you were on Planet Olympics. So right. I think as an athlete, I, I definitely enjoyed Beijing more because it felt like you were yeah just on this. Miss, miss, yeah, miss I guess that's what you always dream about in terms of Olympics. It's like it's it's a total foreign experience, or you know you're going to go yeah. far away, time different. All those things kind of play into it. Mm. Like, memories you've seen as a kid. Because I think going, I mean, obviously having the home support was was phenomenal, but it, I mean, it did. It felt like we were competing at home. In some ways, I think it was more exciting as an athlete to go to a different country. But that must have been, you touched yeah. on a little bit on your journey to that games, and that must have been one where you just didn't want to miss out on it, right? It's just London, mm. <laughs> London, twenty twelve. For every, all that, we talked about how the experience, but in the lead up, you just, I guess you just want to be involved, right? I think you do. Although I think it's, I think as an athlete, you prepare 
the same whatever the games I don't think you necessarily I mean there was more interest in it of course in the run-up but I think as an athlete it obviously it was a much bigger team as well much much more the team GB was, was enormous but I think as an athlete you know even if it was in Timbuktu you'd still prepare the same you'd still just want to do your best and put in your best performance and you know did, did competing at home bring an extra gear I don't think so I think compete, you should be able to bring an extra gear wherever you compete but yeah, it was just it was just such a contrasting experience. Apart from anything, you know, everything in London is about legacy. So there's all these temporary stadiums and all this, you know, all the impact dem- there to demonstrate all the impact at the community level. It's in Beijing. <laughs> it's just like built a stadium and just like knocked it down again. <laughs> just really seem to care. So yeah, it was quite different in that respect. So do you think London 2012 and obviously the the eyes are on rowing more than they would normally be. And I guess it's yeah. a bit of a two-pointed question, really. That would hopefully have raised awareness and raised your profile, especially. But also, I always think in terms of the, the actual success, especially for rowing, success after success. And yeah. when I was younger, maybe like yourself, you'd look at the Olympics and we might win, I don't know, one or two, like 92, mm. you might get one or two medals and something. So being an Olympic champion was like a huge deal, really rare. Now we have mm. every game we go to, there's multiple, multiple yeah. medalists as well as gold medalists. Does it, I guess, does it dilute it slightly in terms of the impact that it can have on an athlete's life afterwards, after the Games? Because there's so many so many medalists, so there's only so many opportunities. I oh, for sure. Yeah, I think it has to. But I'm, I, don't, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But if, as a country, we decided we wanted to put all this money in Olympic sport and we wanted to get all these medals, then we, we've succeeded. But the question is, is that having the right impact at grassroots level? Is that inspiring more people to be active? I mean, I'm, I'm quite a big rugby fan, and you see the England women's rugby team I mean, they're almost absurdly dominant on the world stage because I think they're the only fully professional outfit out there. But they are apparently inspiring this massive, massive upswell in women and girls playing rugby. So you think, OK, in that case, it's probably worth funding how many players they have fully professional if that investment is absolutely paying off in thousands of extra girls taking up rugby. You know, to me, that that that's an investment that's, that's paying off for them. Definitely, we've um, seen it as well in football and um, yeah. women's football, Premier League. It, exactly, and you know, it's, I don't know what you know. If you put that money into grassroots facilities instead, would it have the same effect? I don't know. Possibly, if you if yeah, I probably I, th- I probably think it wouldn't. I don't think you'd have the if the facilities are there. Yeah. you still need the the kind of role model inspiration or just the, the awareness yeah. of it. How did you find retirement then? So when you when you've retired, was it a relief to stop the to stop the training and stop the the early mornings and the and the drive, traveling etc. Well, the irony really was is after retiring, I spent six months as a rowing coach at a university or well, back back at Cambridge University when the girls used to train before lectures in the morning. So I would get up at four fifty five. Oh, to wow. get in the car, to drive out to our training centre, to meet the girls at 5.30, to then, you know, train for two hours and then get on the train back home again. And I'd be thinking, what am I doing with my life? I thought I was going to have lions. Here I am, 4.55 in the middle of winter, like the moon is still high in the sky. It was pretty tough. But yeah, I mean, you do, James, I mean, I think any transitioning athlete will say the same, is you just have to learn life again. Well, not even again, you have to learn life. You have to learn how to be an adult without being totally devoted to your sport. You know, you have to learn how, sh- how much how much should I sleep at night? How, mo- how many calories should I eat? How much alcohol is it? Should I drink? You know, should I drink every day? Should I never drink? Should I drink once a week? What do you do at weekends? What are bank holidays? What do people do at Easter? <laughs> and, and just things like what kind of relationship do I have with my friends and my family when they're not almost like my support team? I mean, I feel quite lucky that I met my my partner just after I finished rowing. So you know, he's never known me as a, as a rower, which I, I really like because I, I think if you're with the same person you're with when you're a full-time athlete, that that relationship has to change, you know, that the roles you have with the each dynamics other. of it, yeah, of course. Yeah, and not to say that a lot of people don't change and you know stay in the same relationship and that's all, all fine, but I personally am quite glad that I was able to almost start afresh and say, This is the new me. And even exercise, you know, how much exercise should you do day to day? I I don't know. And you do have to learn it all, learn it all again. And I think the, the big thing you miss is just that sense of being part of a unified squad where everyone is similar age to you, you know, exactly the same aspirations. You're all trying to do the same thing. And just that energy you get, you know, in the changing room, in the gym, you know, out in the water, that energy you get together when you're all trying to achieve this unbelievable goal. And it's like a defined goal in terms of time, you know, like exactly. what four years and it's just counting down. And yeah. Pressure, yeah. And you never get that again. 
you go to a, a workplace and you're with people of totally different age to you. You know, some of them might stay in the company for a year. Some might be there for 10 years. There's just always this sense yeah, of... Yeah, you never really know if everyone's on the same... Obviously, great, good companies, you can get exactly. that. Getting everyone yeah. on, on the plane together as such and, yeah. and they're all going in the same direction. Yeah, and, and I guess particularly so in Olympic sports where you don't have clubs. So you don't have people coming and going. You know, you literally have the same faces every single day because there's no option if you don't make it the finish your own team. Apart from a handful of people, you can't go and row for another national team. So you're so committed to this one goal in this one environment. And, you know, you want to make that environment as good as it possibly can be because it's yours. You know, you take ownership of it. And I think when you go to the workplace, you never, ever get that that sense of utter synergy with your teammates. Intrigued in terms of obviously you, didn't, you went straight into coaching then and then... Did you say it was six months in, in coaching in that role? What was the yeah. transition then? I'm trying to think of how you found it in the in the mm. workplace, you know, outside of the sport and, and how, how you kind of obviously there's transferable skills, but there's also the challenge mm. of we we're just talking about not everyone's going to be on the same on the mm. same wavelength as you or the same intensity or whatever it be focused. Yeah. So how, how was that for you? Yeah, so I, I then after coaching, I mean I never really wanted to coach. It was, it was a job that came up and I did it for one season, but I, it was never my ambition for lots of reasons, particularly the early starts, <laughs> which I didn't enjoy, and the lack of weekends. And then I went into a full-time job for a while in, in politics, but I think I think as an athlete, because you, you know, that word ownership, you are in charge of your performance and you do have total ownership over what you're doing and you see the outcome of your endeavours immediately. And I think I, you know, I wasn't quite ready to to go to the, the nine to five monthly salary. I wanted to do something a bit more for myself and, you know, fly off the seat of my pants a bit more. So I quit that job and, and set myself up as a self-employed uh, in a self-employed career for about the next uh, seven years, actually. I've just gone back into full-time, well, not full-time. I've gone back into a permanent job now. But um, I thought, right, my passion is sport and what I love to do is is writing. So let's see if I can carve a career as a sports writer. I think so. Obviously, worked across a number of publications, so The Times, yep. Guardian, BBC, all the kind of um, UK majors. And then you, the books on mind games, Mm-hmm. I'm really interested in kind of your process to writing it, but also the the idea. And was it was it kind of a just an amalgamation of the thoughts that you had over time, or was it did you sit, mm-hmm. sit down and say, right, I'm gonna I want to write a book and I want to do it about this, and it was kind of a start and a finish process. Yeah, I mean, it, this is going to sound like a really dreadful kind of insider trading way of getting a book contract, but I genuinely met somebody at a drinks party who was a book editor and ended up writing him a proposal and he accepted it. So you know, these awful stories here of people trawling their manuscript around 15 publishers totally through luck I, I didn't have to do so I, I guess I'd always I'd always been really interested yeah but you had to do you had to do 10 or 15 years of uh of training yeah, and, exactly. in and I still I still had to write the book you exactly. know? But, yeah. yeah so I'd, I'd always been really interested in the psychology of sport and I suppose all the writing I'd done had been based around that side you know the, men, the mental side of it and then a friend of mine published a book about science and I ended up going to her launch party and got extremely drunk and told her editor that I would write him an amazing book about sports psychology. And then the next morning, <laughs> I wake up quite hungover with his business card in my handbag. And uh, yeah, kind of went, went from there. I wrote him a proposal, went away, did some research, wrote a sample chapter, came up with a schedule of, of when I was going to write it, how much advance they were going to pay me, when it had to be submitted, all the kind of details. And then kind of went out into the world with all this enthusiasm to interview athletes and chat to coaches, psychologists, as well as sports people about their about their psychology, about the mental side of their sport, which was just the most fascinating year of my life, to be honest. Yeah, definitely. And then I, you always hear about kind of writer's block, things like that, but I'm assuming the way you, you'd have maybe planned your training and all of you, you'd have had it planned out in terms of checkpoints along the way and getting and, and did, did you ever get behind with it or you always um, no, disciplined I, on top? And, and I, I am it, quite, um, yeah. yeah, I am quite disciplined. I will also have her through found that I was pregnant. So that focused my mind because I could, I couldn't be late with the book. Yeah, because, I need to get this, yeah, get this done and wrapped up. There was this quite significant deadline in my life that you know what was not going to be today. So yeah, so you know, I was I went to Sheffield. I spent a few days at the English Institute of Sport GB boxing set up with all the boxers and the coaches up there. You know, I'm on Zoom to to Hawaii to talk to some foot, some US national team footballers. You know, I'm I'm talking to NFL players. I'm going to meet up with Goldie Sayers to talk about javelin. I mean, I just spoke to all these absolutely fascinating people who just sat down and said to me, what do you want to know? And I'm like, oh, well, so before you did this incredible sporting achievement, how did you feel? You know, how did you build your team? How did you build your confidence? You know, how do you feel about competitiveness and motivation? And it was just, you know, these people just sat there and just told me their 
their innermost thoughts, which was both an immense privilege and just completely fascinating. I mean, I probably could have written 15 books. And as I was going along, because it was something I was so interested in, writing a book was never, ever anything other than great fun. So the whole way along, I had all these ideas in my head and I'm like tap, tap, tapping on the train to and from between London and Cornwall, you know, typing up all my, my central chapters and then drew a line and said, right, no more interviews, I'm just writing. And then kind of my partner was away on work trip and the baby hadn't arrived yet. So I was just kind of locked in the office at home 12 hours a day. So I could get all that. And then, yeah, it, it, it all came out like that. And then, yeah, came out and then you obviously won the, was it the Telegraph Award? Outstanding Yeah. Writer? Yeah, for sport. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was entered into the, the Sports Book Awards, general sports writing category, and it won, which was unbelievable. <laughs> A real surprise, because it was also, it was, 20, it was July 2020. So you think about what the world was like in July 2020. Yeah. There was no black tie dinner which there normally is for the awards so I'm just sat at home with the you know the doorbell rings ding ding and it's the postman he's got this massive box with it you know with the trophy in and oh my god I can't believe this is um can't believe this has just happened so yeah it was which in some ways was more special because then you know all the family and friends would come round and pop the champagne I could celebrate with you know with people close to me rather than being in being at an awards dinner I've got a question in terms of that process of writing the book. Did it make you reflect on, I guess, your own practice as an athlete? You and you're hearing that how other people have done it and your peers. Did you think, oh, maybe I could use that? Or maybe I was pretty good at my um, preparation, etc. How did it How did it make you reflect on your oh, own? Oh, hugely. But I'm sure doing this podcast probably makes you reflect on what you do, James, doesn't it? Yeah, because that's, that's the reason we do it. Yeah, get to meet people and, and yeah. you're always learning, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. So I sit down, I, you know, I listen to all these world-leading athletes tell me about what they do. And I think, oh, I wish... I wish I'd tried to write this book ten years ago. <laughs> I would have been I would have been such a better athlete. But then, short, presumably, you know, the, the lesson is you have to make your own mistakes, don't you? And when you're young, you don't always listen to other people because you always think you're right. <laughs> Right, exactly. anyway. No, yeah, I think it's everyone. So what's in terms of writing it, is there any more books planned and any, anything else in the pipeline? Or maybe no. turning the book into a TV show or documentary? Yeah, I don't know. yeah uh, Netflix Scandi Scandi Noir. Yeah. No, uh, no, no more books planned, no, no. I to be honest, I kind of said everything I wanted to say in that book. There was one chapter that didn't make it in. I did think at the time, oh maybe this could be book number two, but I think realistically, you know, kids, commitments regular income requirements I think the chance yeah, life, having... life takes over sometimes right yeah life takes over but who knows maybe when I'm when I'm in my 60s I'll I'll you know dust off <laughs> dust off all my notes and get going again so currently I know we just really want to touch on you do kind of change gear a little bit talk yeah. about things personally but in terms of your current role with with the laps I'm assuming that's got quite a good quite a strong synergy with yourself in terms of getting involved how did you get involved mm. with with the organization or were you were you a member before you took a role there or yeah, yeah. So I was actually a member. I signed up. Um, I had a, my I had my second child in 2020, and um, when he was about six months old, I thought, okay, I, I want to return to work. Not not anytime soon. Maybe when he's one. So I signed up to a, a few different places and started, you know, trying to create a bit of a job search. You know what it's like trawling the internet, trawling LinkedIn, just seeing what's out there, trying to get a flavour. Updating my CV, which I haven't done for an extremely long time. And then, yeah, kind of had a conversation with the guys at LAPS about the opportunities they had listed. And then, um, but not, none of which were quite right for me at that time. And then, yeah, at some point they rang me and said, well, actually, you've got a, a job going with us. And it was perfect. You know, it was just what I wanted. A small team, really kind of lovely, unified environment, two days a week and lots of writing, which is which is what I enjoy. Definitely. And I, yeah, you can see kind of instant impact as well in terms of what the support you're providing to, to the athletes. I guess your career and you talked about writing the book and meet people. Is there any kind of approaches or concepts that you've, I guess, developed over that time? Your approach to to work or your approach to to uh, lead in or meeting new people. Have you got any anything that you always that you always hang your hat on? I think really getting head around the detail makes a real difference, and I, and I think every sports person will probably be all over this you know one thing you can't be in sport is slapdash you really do have to get as we all know in sport the difference between winning and losing is tiny you know yeah. it is tiny the difference between somebody netting a header at a far post and just missing it is, is a millimeter and that could be the difference between you know qualifying or not qualifying winning a trophy or not winning a trophy you know my sport there's a photo finish you're on the wrong side of it you go home with nothing you're on the right side of it you're olympic champion so you have to be prepared to always live and die by that, but that sometimes it might just come down to luck. But you want to be in control as, of as much as you possibly can do, I think. And and certainly, you know, I don't prepare for any client calls or any piece of work I've got to do without doing a huge amount of research and making sure that I am 
you know, I'm all over it in my head and just spend an extra 10 minutes prepping what you're going to do before you do it, because that will make it better. And if everything that you do is 1% better, then chances are the outcome is going to be significantly better. Definitely. I mean, like controlling the controllables, isn't it? Yeah. You have to be able to look yourself, I guess in sport, you've got certain sports, especially yours, you know if you've done the done the reps and you've done the volume. Mm-hmm. And if you haven't, you kind of probably affects your performance anyway, because you know you, you're not ready, right? And, um, exactly. Great to, um, I guess, transfer that straight into business and into career. It's, it stands up really well. I know you're not a professional athlete anymore, but how do you keep yourself in top shape, like both mentally and physically in terms of approaching work and things? Do you have any habits? Are you out? I'm assuming you're not out at 4.30 anymore in the morning. <laughs> well, not often up with the kids at 4.30. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, yeah I, to be honest, I, I do try to be quite disciplined in how I structure things. You know, I try to, because I think we all find it's hard to, to switch off from what we're doing. So I try really hard also because I'm still juggling few different jobs you know I try really hard to structure my days and my time off as well evenings mornings so I have that time where I can be totally devoted to you know, my kids or totally devoted to going out for a run or you know work or whatever it is so I can really I'm not trying to multitask you know I think I think multitasking is maybe it works for some people it definitely doesn't work for me just trying to be clear okay if I'm gonna have one thing in my head right now for the next hour I want to know what it is be clear about what it is and I'm not gonna have anything else in my head yeah. so even down to I try, I mean, I don't always succeed, but I try to just leave my phone in a different room if I'm not working, because unless I'm waiting for a message from someone, I I don't need to have it there. And if it's there, it's it's a distraction. So just try and put it away and stay really focused on what I'm trying to do. No, I love that. It's so difficult to do that at the moment, I guess, especially in today's society. It is. always something pulling at you. Yeah, it really is. But in terms of sport, I live by the sea. So from, well, from kind of May to September, I just try and get in the sea as much as I can. Brilliant. Which is, Last, which is a nice nice way to exercise. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Nice way to wake up as well in the morning. Yeah. Last question for me. It's in a reflective one. What we normally do, we give the opportunity to kind of just reflect. And if you could go back and speak to yourself as a, mm-hmm. as a let's say, 21-year-old starting out in your career, what would you? What advice would you go back and tell yourself then? I know you've already said you probably wouldn't listen to it. Cause, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's old, but, yeah. If you could make yourself in, listen to something. What blue in the face. I think I'd definitely tell my 21-year-old self just to enjoy it a bit more. You know, I was, as a young athlete, I was so focused on being successful. You know, I really wanted to win medals. I really wanted to achieve on the world stage. And I think I'd just didn't really take enough time just to enjoy the the stuff that we were doing enough which I I try to do now you know I feel like I've I've learned that lesson and now you know particularly with with parenting when the kids are changing so fast I really try to enjoy each stage even though each stage is 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 really tough at times you know so I think that's something that yeah my younger self I definitely say look just slow down pause the success will take care of itself just enjoy it a bit more even the tough sessions that they can be really good fun yeah, um, and, and you're going to yeah, miss it at some stage as well, right? And yeah, and then at, at some point, yeah. it'll all be over and someone else will be taking your place in the changing room. Brilliant. Annie, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate no what problem. we'll do as well. We'll, we'll link everything in the show notes, including the book as well. If anyone's okay. um, not, not read that yet, we'll put a link to the, for them to be able to get a copy. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing so much time with us and being so transparent. No problem. Thanks, James. Thank you for listening to this week's show. You can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud, tweet us at coordinate sport, or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sports, or on my account at james underscore ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka, with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small, with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore, and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sport.